Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this event, Advances of the Panama Canal Hydric Project. Whose high level speakers are Ilya Marota, Deputy Administrator of the Panama Canal, and Jose Euclides Reyes Gonzalez, Vice President of Hydric Projects at the Panama Canal Authority. Ilya, with over 30 years at the Panama Canal, has a Bachelor of Science in Marine, in Marine Engineering from the Texas A&M University, studies at the Development Executive Program from the Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management, a Master's Degree in Engineering Economics from the Universidad Católica Santa Maria La Antigua, USMA, and a major from Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania. Mr. Reyes is an engineer graduated from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and has a title from the International Project Management Association. With more than 37 years of now, he has participated and directed projects such as widening of the Corte Culebra Code, landslide control program, lock maintenance projects, modernization programs, implementation of the ISO 9001 quality management system, and led the administration of the contract for the third set of locks in the Atlantic sector. The need for sustainable supply of water at the Panama Canal has been a top priority since the canal experienced in 2019 its fifth driest year in 70 years. Since then, the canal implemented a fresh water fee, extended water conservation measures, and made changes to its booking system, measures we have already proven to be effective. However, there is still a critical need for the Panama Canal to adopt a long-term solution to securing its water supply for the next 50 years. Therefore, this past September, the Panama Canal Authority published a request for qualifications for the pre-qualification of potential offerers for the engineering, design, and construction of a new water management system that will fundamentally change the way Panama handles its water resources. Today, you'll have the opportunity to hear from Ilya and Jose advances in regards with the important project, lessons learned from previous projects and innovations planned for this implementation, which promises to secure a suitable water management system for years to come for the Panama Canal. At the end of today's presentation, we will open a space for a session of questions and answers, which will be conducted by Jorge Barnett, Managing Director of Georgia Tech Logistics Innovation and Research Center in Panama. We are honored, Jorge, with your participation in this event. Welcome all, and thanks again. Now with you, Ilda Marota. Uh, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Okay, very well. Well, we're going to talk about uh, the second largest project the Panama Canal is envisioning after the, the Panama Canal expansion program, and it's uh, uh, the water project. Basically, uh, we have seen in the last five years we had um, less rainfall than, than, than average, than normal, and the Panama Canal operates on fresh water, plus about 50% of the population of Panama um, drinks water from the canal that was built in 1913 and the other one in 1939. Uh, and you can imagine the, since then the population and the traffic through the canal has increased significantly. So in addition to less rain, rainfall, we are in need to increase our water storage and also uh, additional water sources for the lakes. So. The measures that uh, we want to involve in the in the new tender is uh, innovative water saving methods for the Panama Canal, um, modifications to reservation systems. Uh, we uh, added a freshwater surcharge based on Gatun's daily, daily daily level, which the intention was to tailor the amount of transit to the amount of water. Um, pro, uh, we also did not want nor traditionally we would provide uh, draft restrictions to vessels, which kind of reduces the competitivity of the, of the route. So the intent of adding this freshwater fee this year was also to adjust the amount of transit so we wouldn't have to do draft restrictions, and we were pretty successful on that this year. 
So we need long-term sustainability for the canal. You can see here um, on the left side the what is the canal watershed and the rivers that flow into the lake, and that's our, our storage capacity area. And also the lake levels. We have the red line is the normal curve that we would like to operate on, and the blue one is uh, what we've had in uh, calendar year 2019. So our maximum operating uh, level is 88 feet. That's uh, after the expansion program. We made some modifications. Traditionally, it was 87.5. And we have uh, fortunate that we have reached 88.24 today. So we, we're ready to start on a dry season with a full lake, but that is not every year the case. In addition to less rainfall, uh, we've also seen uh, different patterns of extreme conditions, either severe routes or intense short periods of rain. And this causes us that we do have to spill some water because we don't have enough storage capacity. So in the last, uh, in year 2010 and in year 2000, um, I think 17, we had to spill large amounts of water because we had not enough storage capacity to prevent floods. We can see here the rainfall pattern since 1914 until 2020. And you can see the dark blue line, which is our last um, year. And you can see even it's below the average. So you can see the last years we have been below the average except for one single year. And that's the year, like I mentioned, we had to spill. The main important things for us, the, the two water management components, is we need to provide enough draft for the vessels so we have a competitive route. They can bring the cargo that they need to transit. The Different drafts, depending on the market, they have different competitiveness. For example, uh, container vessels, anything below 45, it's, it's not very good. So we try to maintain the lake at minimum 45 foot draft for the Neo Panamax logs. The original logs, uh, 39.5 is the, the maximum draft we can, we can offer because we do need under the kill clearance. And the Neo Panamax, we can offer up to 50 foot draft right now because of the depth of the channels. Some projects that we have done in the past to increase our storage capacity has been uh, deepening the navigational channels. But um, what we did with the expansion program to save water was uh, we created the water saving basins that allow us to recycle 60% of each transit, the water that each transit takes and even though the Panamax, uh, Neo Panamax logs are much larger than the Panamax, we use in average a 7% less water than transiting ships through the Panamax log. So a lot more cargo with less water. This is the chart on the right. It's to show you the water uses. You can see the green area is uh, basically lockages. We have spilling. You see only in 2017, like I mentioned, there was a couple of years when we did spilling. Uh, 2010 and 2017, we did massive spillings because there was a lot of rainfall in a very short period of time and we couldn't store that water. So we do uh, do some spills. We did those spills. Sometimes we do hydrogeneration also when allowed. Uh, and you can see how hydrogeneration uh, this year we did none because we didn't have enough water. We do have concessions. Uh, for people that take uh, water for businesses, small industries, and of course we have um, portable water, which is the, the blue square. Some of the initiatives that we have looked at throughout the different years, we looked at uh, Rio Indio Reservoir um, way back then when we were thinking the expansion program. It's a project that also was revisited we were um, hired by the Ministry of Environment to look at two projects for, for water. One was Indio Reservoir and the other one was the Bayano Watershed, which is basically a project that would pipe water from an existing lake uh, on the eastern part of the country into the, the canal watershed lakes. We also analyzed within our watershed uh, making additional reservoirs that would allow us to operate our lakes at a higher level, not a navigational lake. It would, this would partition the lake into smaller ones. 
because our patrimony area goes to elevation 100. And like I mentioned before, we operate the lake at 88 at the highest. So there's still some uh, land or a capacity to increase storage uh, if we segregate the main lake. So that was the purpose of the analysis we did for Trinidad Reservoir, Caño Quebrado, Chagres, and Lirio. So these four smaller lakes that we could do within the lake to increase capacity. We also look at uh, desalinization. It's, it's something that we, we did a, a very light look at. We also analyze uh, piping into the, into the lake, pumping uh, the water from the water treatment plants. We also analyze some other rivers in the Atlantic coast that could be a channel into the lake to increase additional water. And also, um, Idan has a distribution system where we have about between 30 and 40 percent losses, so that could be also uh, improved for saving uh, water. So uh, what we're uh, looking at, it's, it's a project that will provide us a water management system where, and it would be an integrated solution to solve the quantity, quality, and the control of the water in the, in the new, in, in the existing watershed. So like I mentioned before, uh, it could be achieved by additional freshwater tributary inflows, by increasing storage capacity, and of course, integrated water management and control system. So summarizing what I said earlier, the problems, droughts and floods, climate variability, increased uh, human consumption, uh, issues of data governance, also increasing transit, transits. The um, holistic approach would be inputs, um, management and storage, and the expecting outcomes will be a climate smart reliability of transit operations, adaptability and resiliency to climate change, guaranteed quantity and quality of potable water for human consumptions, and digital transformation for real-time governance of data. So we, in September, put out a request for proposal to qualify up to five uh, companies that could engage in this project which is envisioned to be an engineering procurement and construction project. Um, it's to be delivered operational, compliant with the functions and performance criteria that it will be established in the RFP. The level of responsibility, the contractor assumes full responsibility for value proposition, engineering, installation, construction, and commissioning of the project. Um, the APC contractor assumes the risk associated with execution, time, and cost. Uh, and this reduces contingency for the project. The relationship and communication aspects, the project is organized between two parties, the ACP and the EPC contractor, and reduces the need for expert hiring to monitor the project. And this pre-qualification um, process was approved for the board of directors and it's ongoing right now. As a matter of fact, we have a pre-bid uh, meeting, I believe is uh, December 11th. Ease of implementation, the EPC methodology is compatible with the current procurement regulations of the Panama Canal, and it would be a best value negotiated contractual modality. And there will be technical and economic weighting. For, for putting out this uh, RFQ, I mean, RF request for qualifications and eventually the request for proposal that will be given to the up to five pre-qualified pre companies, we used the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, design build document. Um, we also use the FIDIC silver book for EPC contracts. Uh, what we've done so far, um, we're right now on the request for qualifications process. Then we'll have the statement of qualifications. We will do the short listing and the employer's requirements. Uh, we'll issue the request for proposal to the five pre-qualified uh, companies, which in turn will have to do their studies, preliminary design, proposal for design procurement, and the construction and turnkey. Like I mentioned, we did the silver book. So um, we have divided the project in two, two main aspects. The first component is going to be focused on um, on selections 
of alternatives that will maximize the storage within the western within the watershed, which is one of the, the, the figures I showed at the beginning. And it will cover two pillars of the program, water storage and technological integration of the system. Uh, taking into account the, the Panama, Panama Canal watershed cap capability, if the amount of water that we can uh, provide from the projects that are proposed, if it wouldn't be enough, then we would uh, do the second component of the program, which would be projects that could be executed outside of the, of the watershed. So that would be phase two. So like I mentioned, uh, we issued in September a request for qualification. The original date uh, was November 9th to be receiving the proposals. We, due to a lot of questions from many companies that participated in the first Previous conference, we issued a, an amendment, and now uh, the second previous conference will be in December 11th, and proposals for the RFQ will be received in January 26th. Then we will do a short list, uh, estimated by February 25th, and we have advice from uh, our legal uh, external advisors, Wilson and Elkins, and also from HHBC Securities to develop both the RFQ and the RFP. So this is basically the summary of the dates. Once we pre-qualify the five companies, there's a target date that we will issue to them the request for proposal, and then they'll have um, up to September to present their proposals. And then we figure, depending on the amount of proposals we receive, because it's up to five, um, we by November 2021 should be able to make an award for the execution of the phase one of the project. Another thing that we'd like to share with you is that all of our procurement uh, projects are online in our web page. The specific project we're referring to in this uh, short presentation is tender 186071. But every tender that the, every bid that the Panama Canal puts out goes on our online system. You can also register to receive notifications when tenders go out. Either to three or five different categories, depending on the area of interest, and you will be notified when there's a bid going out from the Panama Canal. So with that, um, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. And I guess we follow with Q and A's. Thank you very much, uh, Ilya. And now we're joined as well by Jose Reyes. I I like before we start addressing the questions. Uh, one one key element of why we're here facing these projects is that our world is facingly facing constant changes you know uh, whether or not people believe in in uh, what's causing some of these changes the reality is that we have to face them and one of the mantras of acp one of the mottos the trademark phrases has always been over the last years nos encantan los retos you know we love challenges and the one thing i see as someone who works in the logistics sector we understand that when you have a big challenge like this you simply have to take it heads on and you're taking on a challenge that it doesn't only have a sustainability component for the canal itself but it aside from the economic component is the sustainability of our society because as you mentioned you know a, a large chunk of our population lives in the vicinity of the canal watershed so it's important for us you know from an economic standpoint and a social standpoint and this is you know after the canal expansion itself and you two were heavily involved in the canal expansion project so i'm glad to see you two are here talking about this this is pretty much the biggest project that we're going to face over the next few years and it impacts every one of us so for us here as a panamanian you know i find this very relevant and i think for all of us who are listening whether you're in panama or whether you're abroad it's very important to understand that the magnitude of this project you know, and the complexity of it, this is a big challenge and we expect the best possible solutions. I think the, the main expectation here 
is that we find in ourselves the creativity to address this challenge the best way possible. And that's why we want, as a Panamanian, I can say, we want the best firms to participate because we actually want to get the best solutions. This has to be something that is sustainable for us and that is uh, feasible from a technical standpoint, but also manageable and offers us something that we can lean on for the upcoming half century. So, you know, this is the key thing I want to summarize of what was already said. Now, I, I want to thank these speakers. I think it's very important that people listen from you directly, you know, what's involved in this project. Uh, when it comes to questions, we have received quite a few, uh, some of them through our chat interface, and I invite the guests to please, you know, write your questions in the Q&A portion of the, of the interface so that you can, of course, get them to the speakers. Uh, some of them are related to risk, and, and you did mention the, the risk element uh, in your presentation, you know, but I, I want to circle back to that. Because as you said, in the first component, it's going to focus inside the watershed. And one of the questions is, how is the canal going to share risk for work, for any work that the contractor does that has any impact outside of ACP jurisdiction? Well, that's why the first phase would be pretty much within Panama Canal jurisdiction. Um, our watershed, uh, we pretty much like the environmental parts of it, we will be a facilitator. Like, like I mentioned, the, the communication, the interchange will be between the Panama Canal and the contractor. So if it's a project that is developed within the, the Panama Canal watershed, it, the conversation will be mainly with us and we will be um, facilitating some of the social environmental aspects of it. It will depend on the type of project that it's being done. And of course, it will be evaluated at the time. In the RFP, we will address a lot of these issues of the risk sharing. Uh, so that will be in more detail in the future. But like we did for the expansion, we analyzed the risk allocation and the Panama Canal um, took on what was considered that we could manage better. And in that time, we issued uh, special offices. Of course, it was a project a little bit twice what we're doing right now, but at the time, as an example of what the Panama Canal will facilitate or do, depending on, on the needs, is we open up three offices in conjunction with the government to make um, expedite, let's say, the work permits for uh, foreigners, for everything that had to do with import of, you know, the Panama Canal is tax free. And we also did a um, uh, immigration uh, work and um, aduana um, tax. So it, it fits something that the Panama Canal can manage better. Definitely we will be a participant on. the risk sharing. OK, another. Another question that is slightly uh, related uh, because responsibility is a key element here. Uh, some of the people present are wondering how you know who will be responsible for any impact on the resulting performance from the project if for some reason the hydrology parameters or assumptions that are in the approved projects are not met. So, you know, if any changes occur between the moment that the project is formulated and, and uh, when things are executed, is there going to be any responsibility for the contractor of not reaching uh, the performance metrics that were stated in the original proposal? Well, it, it depends on what that is, and I'll give you an example. Um, when we did the expansion program, we had a performance required and had some penalties for the opening and closing of the gates, for the opening and closes of the valves, and it was measured with the specific performance. And there's a test that you pass, and if you didn't pass, you get penalized, and if you don't, you do. So depending on the type of project that we might envision, we will probably right now start analyzing some of the thresholds that you need to guarantee. Now, if there's a climate change that in Panama, the rainfall falls one third of the last 100 years, the average, you know, there's no contractor that can foresee that like we can either. 
but within the parameters that we have the time of issuance, there's certain parameters that if the contractor puts in their terms that they will provide, it has to perform. So it, it will depend on what guarantee are we talking about? Are we talking like if the rainfall is not going to change in the next 100 years? Of course, we cannot uh, have a contractor guarantee that. But there's certain parameters of the performance of the project that is presented to us that need to comply with certain requirements. And that, of course, uh, if it's not compliant, we'll have a penalty. So I don't know if Jose wants to expand a little bit on this, but it will be it will be within reason. There's got to be certain guarantees that need to be provided by the project that they're presenting. Yes, uh, definitely, as Ilya says, the 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 the, the practice is that um, the guarantees and the performance are based on the infrastructures and deliverables that the the contractor provides, and and those will be set up. In, in the RFP, uh, e elements uh, associated to changes in climate. Let's say if, if somebody builds a dam and it has to be filled and it doesn't rain, that's that cannot be a, uh, uh, that risk cannot be transferred to the contractor. The, the 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 performance will be based solely on the infrastructures and the performance of those. Okay, great, thank you. Um, of course, a lot of this has to do with what information is made available to the contractors, you know, the, the feasibility studies or any studies, any technical studies that need to be performed beforehand. So one of the inquiries has to do with uh, what technical information will be supplied to bidder uh, to permit the quantification of risk associated with, you know, all these technical elements, whether it's surface elements, hydrological, etc. Like, uh, uh, is the canal going to perform all these previous studies? Is this going to be provided? Or is this part, in fact, of formulating the solutions that are part of the bidding? We will provide some basic information, uh, data that we have. We will probably will not provide any um, analysis on the data. The, the, we will provide the raw data and the contractor will make their own assumptions, conclusion and analysis. But we will provide as much data as we have available that will be pertinent to the development of the project. I don't know if Jose has uh, more information on that. Uh, I will add that the, the purpose of the contract is to foster uh, creativity and, and the value proposition. So like Ilya said, we will provide the data that uh, the, the canal currently has and, and it's been uh, defined in the RFQ right now. Uh, what is the extent of that uh, information that we have in terms of uh, uh, rainfall data, in terms of uh, uh, cartographic, hydrographic, and, and geological logs that the contractor will need in order to do any alternative that he will decide to provide as a value proposition. So it's, it's meant to be to not to guide to any any solution, but to provide the raw data that will foster that creativity to in all the contractors. OK, thank you. Um, one of the questions as well uh, brings up uh, one of these options. It mentions desalinization. It says, uh, Ms. Marota mentioned desalinization was briefly considered. Can you elaborate uh, you know, what kind of desalinization technology was evaluated? And uh, is it something that is discarded? Or is it also allowed for people to promote any kind of technologies that could make this go back in the mix? No, of course, we haven't discarded anything and we're not uh, promoting anything. I just mentioned what we have analyzed and studied. Uh, what we saw from the salinization is that it's an expensive process, but um, if there's a technology that makes it more feasible, it, it's perfect. And also it could be a complementary or supplementary to another project because this is not about a project, it's about a combination of projects that will provide the required amount of water that that will be established. You know, the, there, there's a goal uh, that we will set. And if you need to do two or three projects to reach that goal, that will be perfect. If only one project can achieve what we need, that will be perfect. So it will be like like Jose said, we want creativity and innovation and somebody to look at maybe something we haven't seen, um, but we are sharing with people what we have looked at. So no, it's not out of the table at all. 
maybe uh, there's a new technology that we're not aware of that could make it a lot more feasible, or the amount that we would need of desalinization, it would be just to complement another project, then maybe it makes it more feasible. Yes, I, I will just add that, uh, like Ilya says, uh, we are open to, to ideas uh, in a portfolio of projects that will bring that value proposition. And like all vendors, uh, um, we will evaluate uh, uh, life cycle costs and, and, and other uh, operative costs and environmental uh, impacts. Uh, to then uh, decide which is the most suitable and efficient solution for, for the ACP. Yeah, and, and I would like to bring up something that has popped up in the presentation and in your answers as well. The word portfolio. You know, you're not focusing on a solution, you're, you're trying to foster you know, a, a portfolio of innovative solutions that together can have the maximum impact in order to sustain uh, the availability of water in the watershed. So this is this is key. The people who are listening to us, you know, you should take this into account. This is not a matter of like, oh, I, I'm trying to to address one specific technology. It's about finding the best, the optimum combination of resources that will somehow lead to a optimal or near optimal outcome for ACP and of course for Panama. Uh, this is key because sometimes we focus a lot on the technology as the solution when in reality it's, you know, you have to look at the system as a whole. And you mentioned the word holistic, which is very relevant in the presentation. You know, the word holistic, it's, it's addressing the system in its entirety, not just a particular portion of it. Uh, one element that has come up uh, repeatedly in the questions is the element of public outreach and, and you know, communications uh, with the outside. And a specific question was, uh, will the canal take on the responsibility and risk of interacting with the government and communities that are impacted by the project? If that was the case. Well, like I mentioned, it, it will depend what type of communication. We will definitely always be facilitating. We are a very interested party. So uh, there will be some risk allocation on different types of communication for different uh, areas. And like I said, phase one is pretty much within the watershed. So most likely most communication uh, within the watershed will be done by us if needed. Um, if it's outside the watershed, it will have to see, we'll have to see, but that will be the phase two, which areas. Okay. Um. There are many issues that are associated with the legal framework that uh, have come up throughout conversations. And one particular concern from uh, one of the people present in the presentation, but I also have seen it subtly mentioned in other elements, is uh, the building of reservoirs. You know, uh, does the building of reservoirs, is the building of reservoirs something that is going to be considered in the first phase or uh, is this is it more relevant for the second one and if so does it require any changes in the legal framework that uh, was built around the Panama Canal expansion in order for it to proceed well it depends if it's a reservoir within our patrimony then it will not if it's outside it, it will yeah okay yes so at the moment moment uh, I invite the people present to please offer more questions if you have any I do want to restate that in order to get the relevant information that pertains to the participation in the bidding process you always need to go back to the link that was presented earlier uh, by Ilya this is very important because in contractual matters like this you always have to refer to the documentation and if you're interested, please participate in the in the meetings that are going to be set up. I think you mentioned there's going to be a private meeting on December 11th. And I would like to offer again the spotlight to you to mention how this process is going to go. You know, the, the, the private meeting, how can people participate and how they should go and get information so that they can look at it in detail. 
because I understand that here, you know, we can discuss a lot of things and, and address some concerns. But in general, you know, you have to participate in the process to get up to date inf information with all the other proponents. So I want to give you that chance to to bring this back again because uh, it's the proper channel for people to get involved in the process. Yes, and I'll I'll start it and I'll let uh, Jose close because he's closer to the day to day mm. part of the project than I am. But it's very important that if you're interested, you you go and look at the request for qualifications um, and participate in the pre bid conference because that's the forum where all of the concerns of all the potential contractors get addressed. And we make a formal notification of all the questions that we receive and then they're released. So everybody is on the same page and everybody gets the same answer. So in that meeting, uh, we get a sense of the main concerns and then we're able to address them. And if there needs to be some kind of a amendment to the RFQ to clarify certain things, it will be as a result of that meeting, which will take place on December 11th. So Jose, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, I think it, that's the, the best score for action. Anybody interested should, should go directly to our website, download the, the tender of the RQ, and the, in that tender, you will have instructions to, to ask for the participation in the, in the meeting of December 11, where you will have the opportunity to, to ask any, any element of the contract itself, uh, and it will be within our legal framework with the contracting officer responding formally to an amendment uh, to communicate all parties of all the questions has that will be uh, set in that uh, forum. So I foster that and 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 I think uh, any any element of the contract will be responded accordingly in that meeting. OK, thank you, Sir. Nilia. A um, couple of questions have popped up related to the standards that are going to, going to be used. You know, and they mentioned that uh, from previous experience, you know, ACP leans towards the American Water Works Association standards. Is that going to be the predominant in this process or uh, is it going to be ISO or a combination? Uh, I can say that uh, we, we have a heritage in this country to follow uh, uh, American standards, ASTM, ASCE standards, and also we homologate that with DIN standard and ISO standards for to be open. But uh, as, as Ilya is showing in the in the presentation, our, our tender and our contractual structure is based mostly in the American Society of Civil Engineers standard for this kinds of work, and also with the FIDIC uh, template for the contract which is uh, a format that is uh, widely accepted in all major companies and lenders uh, organizations. Something we have done in the past uh, in other contracts, if there's an equivalent standard that is not the one that specifies, sometimes we specify or similar. Um, and if it's not um, clearly specified, if there's a different proposal, once the contract is um, let's say ongoing and you find another standard, we do do a bridging to see if it complies or not. And if it complies, we, we could accept something else. If it doesn't comply, then we won't. Um, one element and, and this, you know, could very well be something that uh, was mentioned briefly in the presentation was uh, whether the project will contemplate or include in any way environmental care projects surrounding the, the forest uh, in the watershed. Again, I think it will depend on the project and I'll give you an example. Um, with the expansion program, there was a requirement for reforestation of certain he hectares to some projects uh, and then the Panama Canal undertook most of it. So it will depend on, on what it is. Now this is an EPC. So the idea is that the contractor would untake everything. But uh, if there's a definition on, on where would that take place, then we would take on that responsibility to decide if we need to do some reforestation or things like that. Then we will join with the contractor and decide where does it need to go. But being an EPC, the idea will be that they will provide 
that solution because it has to be an integral part of their project. They need to measure the impact that their project will create. And depending on that impact, then we could be a facilitator for part of it. Yes, I, I will only add that um, the ACP has a very robust uh, environmental and social program on the way, and we are considering green route. So uh, our program will be set on, 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 on a green framework. Uh, like Ilya says, we will define in the RFP those elements that uh, will be addressed by the contractor in addition to the ones that we currently adopt in within our watershed of the canal. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one, one element that goes into the environmental impact is, you know, uh, the monitoring of salinization levels in the lakes and other, some of these things are already done by ATP, right? So. Uh, one of the questions is, you know, if if this is going to be part of the project, and, and I guess, uh, and I don't want to be leading uh, the conversation, but I would say I would guess that all of this is included. You know, the, the, the having the proper methodologies to monitor environmental impact of any of the solutions that are going to be implemented or that are going to be considered is all going to be part of the scope anyway. Yes, that's correct. That's a true statement. Yes, I, I will only add that as, as Ilya showed in, in his presentation, the, the, the high level requirements of, of the program itself contain those uh, quantity, quality and control of the water. And when we say quality is because we are, this has this responsibility to provide the raw water, fresh water for human consumption of half of the population of, the, of Panama. And, and definitely uh, the uh, salinity is something that we have to control and it, it will be within the elements that the contractor has to address uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, that the infrastructure that he will propose will contribute to reduce that um, intrusion of salinity within the freshwater uh, body. This might be uh, already stated within the, the the published process, the, pub the published breathing process, but one question that I think could be relevant for the public is uh, what is the expected impact uh, of phase one, which is the one focus within the watershed, uh, how many for how many years does ACP foresee that phase one could secure water? Or this is also part of the parameters that have to be weighed. It's possible that some of the proposals could offer, uh, uh, you know, broader solutions that could cover for more years. But do you have a minimum expectation of what's the length of time that phase one should cover when it comes to water security, both for human consumption and kind of sustainability? More than time, I think it's a minimum volume. Yes, I, I would say Ilya's right. Uh, uh, we cannot, let's say, uh, address uh, forecasting in the world that is constantly changing, uh, but we can actually uh, expect or calculate a volume that can uh, satisfy the needs uh, in, in to reduce risk of, of affecting the the, the continuity of the operations of the canal and our uh, responsibility to provide the fresh water to human consumption. And, and that will be the value of the different proposals that we will probably set a minimum, but if somebody can come up with something better, then it might have more points. Because if it can provide, and it's gonna be a cost effective uh, project, you know, it's like I said, it's a best value proposition. So it will be, uh, incremental if, if you can provide more water for for a, a less cost overall then it will probably be a better proposal um one question that has has to do a little bit with the contract structure itself and and you're free to answer it or you can leave it for the for people to participate in december 11th meeting which i mentioned again because it's very important uh, is whether tenders will be open to use any subcontractor and subcontractors and is there going to be any regulation attached to the handling of project subcontractors 
you know, in terms of opportunities for companies, you know, whether it's local or international companies to participate. It's the use of subcontractors or, uh, you know, joint ventures or any of those other collaboration models going to limit or going to actually incentivate the participation of local and international companies. I think right now we're not envisioning joint ventures, but subcontractors definitely, as long as they comply with our regulations. Um, so I don't, I don't see a problem with subcontractors at all, um, but I'm not familiar with the details of the RFP or the RFQ, so I don't know if Jose has something else or if he wants to leave that for uh, December 11th. I would say that, that you cover completely uh, the ACP, the joint, the allowing joint venture in ACP is the exception, not the rule. So uh, at this time, uh, there's uh, the, the tender uh, not allowed joint ventures, but has the, the uh, allowed the subcontracting and that will be set on the RFP of the of the contract. And once again, it's very important for people to be aware that uh, the, the particular process requires that if, if you want to get technical details of how, you know, you sh what's the proper way to structure a proposal, you should be present at the uh, private meeting in December 11th, because that way you can get the official information which all the potential interested parties uh, will get. You know, that would be the official source of information. Um, you know, at this point, uh, we have we have a few questions, but some of them are, are uh, focused on very particular issues pertaining to the watershed itself. So I, I wanna, I just want to take a minute because I think we're in the process of, of wrapping up. You know, we we have a schedule and we want to respect the schedule both of ACP but of the people who are participating in the audience. And then I will uh, shift the microphone back to to Luis and the Amsham team. You know, one of the key elements of a project like this uh, you know you, you either state a solution and you find the best price element for the solution or you try to find a solution through the bidding process and in this case it's very important that people understand that this is for companies to also come up with their best ideas you know based on the information that acp is going to provide and context information so they can come up with the best ideas it's not only about i sell this technology it's about let, what is the best way to address this problem, this challenge? So, you know, we have to look at it from a standpoint of, of finding a solution and not uh, pushing a solution, it's finding the proper solution. So once again, I invite the people to participate uh, in the meeting so that you can get the questions channeled to the contract officers, uh, to the proper uh, procedures. And I invite the staff from Amsham to join us back again if they have any closing remarks that are related to the to the presentation to today's presentation. Thank you, Jorge. No, just to thank uh, Ilya and, and Jose. Jorge, really a, a great amount of information, valuable information. We, we thank you in, in the name of Amsham and, and all the American companies that joined today. Uh, thanks for your for sharing all of this knowledge about this important project. And uh, I'm sure that you're going to see lots of good competition, uh, not only on the on the second homologation meeting, but also in the pre-qualification uh, submission date. So thank you very much. I know that if you have uh, people here, if, if, if you have other questions, uh, again, I, I invite you to join the, the December 11 meeting. And I'm sure that uh, all of the information that the ACP has regarding this project is uh, public in, in their website. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all for the Bye, have a great weekend. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye.